this is the last part of the story. I hope you enjoyed the series. I request you to like this video and subscribe to my channel for more good stories like this one. Without further ado, I will now start the last chapter of the story. Running down the corridor, Jean-Francois looked behind every so often to make sure those strange plant aliens were not following him. Many thoughts raced in his mind, such as the fate of the alien that had been absorbed by the plant-like life form, but for the sake of his sanity, he tried to clear his brain of it. This side of the station seemed almost deserted, having only come across glimpses of three other aliens' backs as they ran in other directions than him. Seeing no one else head towards where he was heading worried him somewhat, but it remained the best course of his action in his mind. Soon, he reached the dome's entrance and found the doors to be unlocked, to his relief. The dome was rather quiet as he opened the doors. Most had fled the open area to hide elsewhere. Still, a few sat at the bar, either oblivious to the situation or without a care in the world. Jean-Francois paid them no attention and headed straight for his goal, the steel suit hangar. Unluckily, however, these doors were locked and he had no idea how to open them. After fiddling with the electronic box next to the door to no avail, he opted to try and find someone from the teams in order to open the doors, and so headed for the bar area. On second thought, perhaps it was onerous to associate it as a bar area, since alcohol was clearly not part of any creature on board's diet. What else would one call a half-moon crescent counter where customers sat and drank? A juice bar? Once there, he quickly recognized one of the regulars. Hey, you're, uh, the day mead simmerit? Esso near team pilot, right? He hoped it was indeed the right person, and he hadn't just done the faux pas of essentially saying they all looked alike. The da maid lowered its beverage and squinted at the human. It's simmerit yet human. What are you doing here anyways? Don't you know we're getting boarded as we speak? Exactly. I had an idea. We can use the steel suit to destroy their spaceship. It has to be docked somewhere on the station. Then, with no way to retreat, we'll be in a good position to negotiate, exclaimed jean Francis, full of enthusiasm. The damaged sighed. They'll be gone soon anyways. Why go through all this risk? Just sit here, have a drink and wait for all this to blow over. Jean-Francois shook his head negatively. I just left class to go to the bathroom. I came across one of those raiders on the way back. I have to do something. I can't let them do anything to the class. Bitch, you persistent human. I won't let you drag me into this. Here you can go be a heroic suicidal wannabe hero on your own. Simriot handed him a small, flat and circular-shaped metal object. That's the authentication key you'll need to open up the hangar doors. Steel suit itself isn't locked up. Jean-Francois hastily grabbed the offered object and uttered a quick thanks before he sprinted towards the hangar. Key in hand. The doors opened without a fuss, and he darted straight to the familiar steel suit he piloted the other day. A bit like driving for the second time. Jean-Francois tried to remember exactly how it was done the first time around, but with limited success. He'd gotten in, managed to get into the seat, but was at a loss on how to proceed further. Only difference was that it had already been started for them that time. They had only needed to get in. Time was ticking, and the added stress did not help. Making a pressured Jean-Francois look around wildly in order to figure out how to start the damn thing. His frustration mounted and turned into despair. A voice called out to him. Figures. Move over. I'll show you how it's done. Similarly, it climbed aboard and began the sequence to activate the steel suit. Now go fetch me my chair. This thing's way too big for me. In the classroom, Elsona was still not quite over the fact that little Barry over there, nearly half her height and likely no more than a third of her weight, had managed to whip himself up in a frenzy and overpower those pirates. She felt somewhat conflicted over the matter, as she loved the general idea of someone saving the damsel in distress, but also guilty because if it were not for her presence, they likely would have avoided this particular classroom, being the most valuable hostage. Aside from her father, on the station meant that she felt particularly targeted by these recent events. So, this is done for now, but we should probably head somewhere else. No. Laura asked the teacher. Mrs. Modron, still digesting the violence that had occurred in her classroom, acknowledged Laura's idea. 
I am afraid you might be right. I have no idea what the other pirate's reaction would be to what has happened here, but I cannot presume to think it would be... civil. We must seek refuge elsewhere. Taking a pause, she then spoke to Izumi. How is Barry doing? Is his state stable? Uzumi, who was checking up on Barry, left his side and approached the front of the class, looking at Mrs. Moldrin. He's all right for now. It'll get better with time. Can you give us any more information about the pirates? Are they a type of plant species like they seem? Anything about their biology you could explain? I fail to see how it will help but very well. Let's move first, and then I'll tell you everything I know about the Ishini. There is a room not too far from here where we store seldom used objects that still have a purpose. Mrs. Moldrin headed for the door, opening it slightly and peeked outside. Satisfied, she waved the class to follow her. The giant conga line of students slipped out of the classroom towards the small storage room, fitting inside but being rather cramped. Everyone held their breaths, listening and watching for any possible sign that they were heard or seen coming here. Seconds turned into minutes as students slowly lowered their guard and began talking among themselves in hushed tones. The humans gathered around Mrs. Modron, and Lasorna made sure she stood not much further away. She had to admit that she liked the way that humans tended to find themselves in the middle of every situation, poised to take on leadership roles or just get stuff done. Looking at her fellow students, she was disappointed by their lack of action. However, she understood that many of them were simply raised this way. Let me see what I can remember about the Ishini, began Mrs. Moldrin. They initially evolved as patient predators, ambushers of sorts. By standing very still, they could become invisible to the local fauna that had mainly a movement-based vision. So, kind of like carnivorous plants, inquired Izumi. Well, their diet was complemented by this. Their main way to gain energy, however, was and remains photosynthesis. Some believe it is that extra addition of energy from their ambushes that enabled them to develop further motor functions. Laura twirled a finger in her hair and seemed lost in thoughts. Interesting. This gives me an answer. Izumi prodded Laura for more. Well, can you tell us more? It's coming together in my head. We're going to need bait. Access to the electrical grid in a room. It Elsa Ney was quite intrigued by Laura's demands and plan, but felt a tinge of worry when both human girls turned to look at her simultaneously. Do you even have any idea where the pirate ship could be? Dare I remind you again of the size of this space station? Asked Simriot with annoyance dripping from his every word. <laughs> Away. Well, I would say not too far from the classrooms, I think. Alarm sounded just before they were seen there. Now, where that is exactly from the outside, I've no idea, replied Jean-Francois, a bit defeated. The steel suit piloted by the Damede was progressing smoothly, its magnetic leg locks behaving well and the small pilot's skill was apparent with how much ground they were covering. Jean-Francois had set up on the weapons, ready for a fight that had yet to come. Look, even if we find it, those lasers are tuned down quite a lot. We're not going to do much damage to that ship remarked Simuriet. Jean-Francois nodded. There's a good chance the laser might not work, true? If that happens, then we can just use brute force? When realization of what the human meant came to Simuriet, it hit him like a train. You don't mean. They're just going to shoot us before we get to do what you think we're going to do. If they're docked, it'll be mighty hard to do. If they undocked a shoot at us, that means the pirates are stuck on the station and no one is getting kidnapped. Then it's just a matter of time until we get reinforcements right. You make it sound cut and dry. It's hardly anything but a foolproof plan. I, look, don't talk any more. You're going to give me an aneurysm. Similarly, it shook his head to try and change his train of thought. The worst part was that the way the human explained, it was starting to make sense to him, but he knew it was folly. Somehow, though, John Francois had managed to plant a seed in his mind that this was actually possible to pull off. Having adjusted the steel suit's trajectory, the Daymead kept an eye out over the horizon looking for anything that might feel out of place. The longer they could manage to stay undetected, the best their odds were. If they managed to actually pull it off, though, commendations would be thrown their way. Perhaps the prestige and fame from this would be enough to earn his citizenship back. A few minutes later, 
the Yashini ship was finally within view. Carefully, Simile had positioned the steel suit so that it blended with external equipment from the station, using it as cover as they approached. The Daymead exhaled and then took in a deep breath. All right, get ready. This is hit and run. Aim for the weapons and the engines. We're not setting up shop down there. Let's see if your accuracy is as good as your buddy Barry. Jean-Francois gripped the controls tightly. The challenge was on. Say that again. Almost shouted La Sona. Lura tried to use her hands to gesture for her to calm down. We need someone to lure the pirates in a particular location. They would have a hard time shooting you with your scales and we need them to want the target. If I'm not mistaken, your father is a diplomat, yeah? So that would make you sort of a high target, I think. Seeing how Lissona didn't seem convinced, Laura added, We won't let anything happen to you. We'll be right there. Izumi also stepped in. The rest of the plan, you understand it, right? I do, but it's going to take a long time. Are you sure you can pull that off? It was an unorthodox type of plan, to be sure, thought La Sona. Dari approached and put a hand on her arm. I guarantee it. What? Ah, fine. You all owe me for this, though. She was going to agree to it anyhow, but why not get something out of it while at it? Laura nodded and started giving out orders, everyone going to their position. The door opened and Lasuna headed out, picking up a good pace and making sure her footsteps resonated loudly. It didn't take long for her to pick up a trail. Three Yashanis started heading her way, slithering rapidly with their vines. Elsona did not look behind, keeping her focus on her pace. It would serve no purpose to see how many chased her. She needed all of them after all. Turning around would only cause them to attempt and tranquilize her, due to her softer underbelly. The chase itself could not last too long either, else they would split up in order to corner her. She pressed on passing an intersection where she saw more Yashini join the chase from the corner of her eyes. She proceeded to carry them on a defined path for many minutes, creating a pattern that would prevent chasing enemies from being able to cut her off. Rounding the next corner, La Sonia saw one of her fellow students open a side door and give her the signal she had been waiting for. She made her way towards the designated area, willing her legs to keep moving forward, exhaustion and muscle fatigue setting in. She was nearly to her destination. The door to the room held open by another student at the end of the corridor when her knee gave in and twisted, causing her to fall down. Her heart sank as she struggled to get back up, the precious distance between her and the pirates evaporating rapidly. Struggling, she got back up, but only managed to limp forward at a much reduced pace. A powerful sense of dread began to make its way in her thoughts. She had failed her friends in the academy, who knew what the Yashini would now do to her. She managed to keep staring ahead, not wanting to look behind and lose all hope. Out of the doorway a short distance away, really, but now seemingly out of reach, Barry poked out his head and looked at her. At least she would be able to say goodbye, she thought. That was until a split moment later. The insane human propelled himself at full speed out of the door and raced towards her. She wanted to scream at him that it was too late, that there was nothing he could do but could bring herself to do it. It was cowardly she knew, but a tiny part of her wanted to keep believing that something was possible. These humans had defied many expectations after all. Still, he could not fight off all of them on his own. Perhaps he could buy some time for her to reach the room and exit out of the back door. But they outnumbered him too much. As Barry got closer, she could hear him scream. Something seemed to fuel him. Hang on, he shouted, finally reaching her. She was surprised to see him stop and bend low in front of her, his arms extending towards her. Her shock grew as Barry lifted her off the ground and then turned back the other way, running while carrying her. It was not graceful like she had seen in human stories, where a knight in shining armor carried off a princess. He was simply not big enough to be able to wrap his arms around her that way. Instead, he had grabbed onto her legs and lifted from behind, leaning the center of her mass against his back. Their speed increased above what her limp was but was still slower than Barry's full sprint. As Barry entered the room and exited out of the other side, Elsona saw Laura and other students positioned close by. Once Barry crossed the other side of the back door, his grip on Elsona faltered and both went tumbling down. 
as if on cue, Laura began giving orders. Disconnect the lights. Get ready to close the door when they've all crossed the first one, and then also close the other door. The students obeyed, removing wires and cutting them from a nearby electrical panel. As another one shouted from another position, able to see the Yushini enter the room, the doors were then closed on them, trapping the dozen or so pirates into the dark empty room. Really quickly, they began working to disconnect the power supply from the doors, to prevent them opening them from the inside. Laura oversaw their work and added a few extra things. Make sure you cut out the heat as well. I want them nice and cold out there, and we'll have the fires outside the doors. The doors would only last so long, however, so the others began installing secondary defensive measures. Lesona lay on the floor, her heart racing and breathed a sigh of relief. Feeling a small, steady pressure in her back, she remembered Barry and quickly rolled off of him. How did you do that? she asked of him, perplexed. Panting, Barry lifted a finger up to ask for some time to catch his breath. Probably a combination of things. The cocaine, the lower gravity, the adrenaline. He managed to get out before stopping to focus on breathing once again. Izumi came to the pair and helped them stand up. No time for laying down. We still have stuff to do. Barry, I need you to go get Jean-Francois's heating plate. We're going to need it. Jean-Francois's ears rang as he got out of the steel suit back at the hangar. Thanking Simriot for his help, he headed out of the dome to get back towards the class. It had been a few hours now and the pirates had nowhere to go. Now was the time to negotiate everyone's release. To his surprise, when he reached the classroom, he found two Yashini bodies laid out on the floor and no one present. It seemed they had fought back, but there was no telling what had happened afterwards. Wandering about aimlessly, he finally came up on a large crowd of students sitting in front of a closed door, a small fire burning in front of the door. What's going on here? He asked the closest student. Oh, hey, we were wondering what happened to you. Figured you got captured by them before we managed to trap them in here. Now we're following Laura's plan, seeking them, answered the alien. Hearing Jean Francois's voice, Izumi's head popped out from the crowd, and she waved at him to come over. He approached and sat down next to her against the wall of the corridor, to the left side of the door. What's this about a siege? Well, it was safer than taking them head on. We figure we can just starve them out. Started a fire at this door using your hot plate, and there's one at the other door too. It keeps them away from the doors. We need to keep this up for a few days until reinforcement arrives and then we'll be done. We should go speak to Laura. She hatched up the plan. She's on the other side with Barry. Jean-Francois stood up and headed the long way around to the other door. Butting Laura talking with a few students, he stepped in after the conversation was over. So you guys have been pretty busy too, huh? Hey, glad you're okay. You have no idea. A lot of it was assumptions, but we had to do something, anything. Now that they're in the dark, they can't regain energy, and we're using heat to keep them away from the doors, fire being the natural enemy of plants. They're patient ambushers by nature, so that's working against them too. What have you been up to? I went to the dome and got a steel suit. Then with Simriot, we disabled the pirate ship so they wouldn't have a way off station. He tried to keep it short and to the point. No use mentioning how they dodged enemy fire and almost got blown up a few times. Laura gave him a thumbs up. Great. That takes care of one thing I was worried about, which was pirate reinforcements. Ah, there you are. I was beginning to worry about your disappearance, Mrs. Moldron said as she approached the pair. But are you certain we can keep them confined for so long? We will have to sleep at some point. We can take rotating shifts to make sure there's always someone watching, clarified Laura. Rotating shifts. One must sleep when they are tired. You cannot delay the inevitable, insisted Mrs. Moldron. You can't. Humans can stay awake quite a long time if they want to. It does come with severe adverse health effects, though. We could just do the night shifts then, and then in the day the rest of you can cover us while we sleep, added Jean-Francois. Laura nodded and smiled. All that's left to do now is play the waiting game. A little more than three days was what it took for military forces to make it to the station. By then, the Aishani had been forced to undergo dormancy, due to lack of sunlight and nutrients, which
which was also helped by the room going colder than intended. The security teams, once they arrived, were able to safely and easily remove the pirates from the station. After a few days of rest and no classes, all students were called into the main auditorium. The headmaster looked across the entire room, his gaze passing on every student. All were arrayed side by side in the largest room of the station, a meeting by the academy having been called. I want to begin by offering thanks to those who stepped up and helped defend their fellow students against the Iceni. Your actions were brave. We owe you a great deal of gratitude. We will contact your governments and ask them on how to proceed with regards to potential commendations. Taking a short pause, he resumed. Now, the events of the last few days have shown us that perhaps we have been too complacent. This is a failure of both myself and the administration. But we will be fixing the damage that was incurred and redesigning the station's security. As the Academy will be unable to operate as intended during this time, we will be starting the work experience program earlier than anticipated. All of you will receive up to three options, based on your scores and aptitudes, of a profession to shadow someone in. Your teachers will now pass these on to you. Please exit the room once you have them. The deployments will begin over the course of next week. Starting with those in front, the teachers began approaching students and talked to them while presenting their choices, offering guidance. Soon, the room diminished and only the four humans remained standing at the back. Their two teachers approached together and greeted them, with Mr. Flog talking first. This is a bit unusual, we must admit. When evaluating you, we had to consider the positions you would be best suited for. This proved problematic as we couldn't figure out where you'd perform poorly. Mrs. Muldron continued. Naturally, we would have recommendations based on what we observed, but at the end of the day, we do not think there would be any bad choices for you to take. Turning towards Barry, Mr. Flog handed him three small plates of metal that were engraved. Barry, we would suggest something that enables you to make use of your physical strength, good reflexes and bravery. We think that a military career would work best for you or perhaps something with the Steel Suit Leagues. Mrs. Muldron approached Laura and handed her three small metal plates as well. Laura, your quick thinking and ability to create plans would make you a good asset for military command. Those same skills, however, could also be used in other domains such as infrastructure planning. Mr. Flog proceeded on to Izumi. It's on your calm nature, even under stress and the way you're able to communicate would make you a good diplomat, I believe. You have no issue with absorbing new ideas, even learning how to work with alien technology. You could easily join a think tank or help integrate human technology with ours. Lastly, Mrs. Muldron went up to Jean-Francois. Louis, you are perhaps the strangest of the four. You have ideas and concepts that are entirely foreign to us and know how to execute them. You've displayed skill at piloting a steel suit and are decently versed in a few subject matters. Yet, we do not know your true potential. You'd certainly be able to make it as a merchant or the founder of a company, but at the same time we could see you spread knowledge about human culture as a foreign ambassador. The two then stepped back, with Mrs. Muldron wrapping it up. Your paths are yours to choose, as we believe you likely know better than us. If you wish to choose something different, we have left one of your plates empty so it can be engraved how you wish. Why are you using metal plates? asked Barry, turning them over in his hands. Sometimes it feels good to have a physical reminder of one's accomplishments. We could easily have done it digitally, but for many... This is a trophy or sorts. Your plates are yours to keep and past students have often kept them for their whole lives, Mr. Flog answered. Laura looked at the two teachers and asked, How long will this work experience last? Fourteen human months, give or take a month from my rough approximation of your calendar, replied Mrs. Muldron. Their questions answered. The teachers then left, leaving our four humans to themselves. Well... I guess we're going to split up, huh? muttered John Francie. Unless we all went to the same place, yeah. But we'll come back here afterwards, right? added Barry. I'm looking forward to it. It's exciting, chimed in Laura. Well, guess I'll go look at my options in my room. I'm sure they're listed somewhere on their net. 
said Izumi as she began to walk out of the room. Hey, let's keep in touch, yay. Jean-Francois mentioned, walking out of the room with the group.